Welcome to the Prime Real Estate Mastermind. I'm your host, Justin Conoco. This is your go-to spot for all things real estate news, experts, insights, and networking. This started last, actually two years ago now, we launched it live with one of the largest land developers, Sasha Chuchu's, and my buddy Jazz Takar, and it's grown into something amazing where every single month on the third Saturday from 9 to 10 a.m., we bring on an expert and we dig into their minds. This is a no-pitch no sell zone. This is for the people by the people. So you're not going to get us trying to sell you anything. We're really just going to try and give you a macro perspective as to what's happening in the real estate market. And then we go down to the micro. Uh, but more than that, we dig into the minds of people who are actually doing the things you want to do. Today's guest, I'm very excited about. I'm actually going to share my screen here and give you a little bit of background on him. His name's Corey McKinnon. I actually got a phone call this morning about this podcast with a client that we've listed a property for that says, Corey's the man. He says he's such a great guy. And it's another high level investor. Actually, Grant McDonald has been on this podcast and had great things to say. So this is what this network is, right? We bring people in proximity to people that are doing things at a high level. So you can actually see Corey's profile here on his website. And he's been putting deals together since he was 11 years old. When I was doing my research, I smiled and I absolutely love that. And how did he do it? He had a really big why, right? And he really wanted to execute and create that limitless livelihood that everybody tries to have. And this is what really caught my attention. Another deal won't change my life, but it can change someone's life who is struggling to get started in real estate investing. I think a lot of people are realizing that the tool and the vehicle of real estate investing, it's not the golden ticket, but if you work, it can unlock quite a few doors and you know, you're not going to get rich by the transaction, but you're going to get rich through the wealth of relationships you build and the opportunities you get in real estate. And he does coaching now as well. And he's really in that space where he's giving back his time. He says his currency of time is doing things bigger and faster. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring him on to the actual podcast was to dig into how he's effectively doing that. A lot of people find that they don't have enough time. Maybe they have a job. They can't get into real estate investing. So we're going to unpack a whole lot of those things. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring him and Lindsay on screen right now. And we're going to start talking about the market before we dig into the interview. So Corey, welcome to the mastermind. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm super pumped. Like I said, we have a lot of people in proximity to each other. I know we've chopped it up in the past. Lindsay, are you excited to see Corey today? So excited. We know so many people that have success working with Corey and um, just people that know of you. So I'm so excited to have you on today and uh, really get into all of our questions. And actually, my mom was um, telling me that I think she did a Tony Robbins thing with you. So she's also excited mm. to get all her questions answered too. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I did Tony Robbins Inner Circle about four years ago. So yeah, that's awesome. Does it feel like a lifetime ago, Corey? <laughs> it does, man. That was a couple kids ago. That's when my uh, four year old <laughs> was just born. So um, but no, time flies fast when you're when you're having fun and buying real estate. That's amazing. So if you want to connect with Corey or anybody that's in the prime real estate mastermind group, you go to our Facebook page. There's a private page. If you're in that group, we can actually drop the stream here or the link into there. Eric, our producer can do that during the episode. So we'll do a Q and a at the end. If anybody wants to come on live to meet Corey, I would highly suggest it. If you make that small effort and you connect with somebody like Corey, and then you send him a DM after on Instagram, you'll be shocked at the level of interaction that there is among the investor community. And that's one of the coolest things I see, Corey, is just the willingness to share, right? And I think people in your position really understand that the abundance mindset is a real thing. So let me ask you that first, before we get into the market, how do you think about that? Because I think a lot of people say, well, you know, I've achieved success. Why would I share my secrets? What, what are your thoughts around that? I think when people get to a certain level of financial success, you would you would hope they'd start to kick into some different human needs, right? Whether that, you know, contribution or growing, growing together. So for me, growth and contribution is really, really huge. Um, you know, I'm taken care of, like all my basic bills have been taken care of a long time ago. So, and like I mentioned on my website, like, you know, if I buy a new, another duplex or multifamily property, it's it's going to change my life a little bit. But if I can help someone else, you know, buy something, I know I was helped in the beginning as well, back, you know, 15, 16 years ago when I bought my first property. I mean, there was no real information on the internet. And even if there is, it's a, it's a pretty, you know, burdensome, uh, burdensome, um, just amount of information out there just to try to navigate. Right. So I, I just like to try to help people, you know, see the true wisdom and what they actually really need to do. 
it's yeah there is an overflow of information it's like there was no information and everybody with an internet connection started putting information out there and some of it's a little dangerous but i think you'll see through lines between successful investors and some people that are doing things at a high level so i'm going to screen share again i want to share a couple things that i pulled up in terms of the market just to get some quick reactions this will be like one of those reaction videos we see online so the first thing i pulled up was cp24 i just put this out the housing market moves from a high degree or from moderate to a high degree of vulnerability. And let's extrapolate this a little bit. CMHC is the government backed insurance. And historically, when CMHC makes claims about the real estate market, they have been wrong time after time after time. Um, Scott McGilvery was actually on the podcast in January. And this is the first question I asked him. And we dug into it. So if anybody wants to watch the back episode, you can do that. And what's funny is, though, they talked about how you know, the vulnerability ratings in the major cities and the overvaluation of real estate is really what's driving them and to make these claims, right? So they try to throttle the real estate market, but this goes to another article that came out. And this is the hilarious thing that I saw was, you know, the, the shift in the market. So you have the Bank of Canada and you have the government backed insurer that are looking at price changes. And the shift is the result of the growing gap between the variable risks that move along with the overnight rate fixed rate and have followed bond rates yield hires. The spread is set to further expand and the Bank of Canada's pledges it won't raise the benchmark rate until the second half of 2022. What I find interesting is CMHC is actually with the Bank of Canada, almost talking out of both sides of their mouth saying, well, the risk is really, really super high, yet they're controlling the rates and they're actually keeping money fairly low thus increasing the demand like they're not really tracking consistently so what are your thoughts in terms of the overarching theme that we have an overvalued market and there's a high risk versus what you're actually seeing in the streets Corey? well it's interesting you know how they go from zero to 60 uh, all of a sudden we went from low low risk to now we're high risk so based based on what um and like you said they're they're talking two different sides of the story and yes they have been wrong um, through this pandemic many times. So uh, maybe they're just trying to get some news, some reads, um, you know, who knows. But I mean, I feel like, yes, things are getting more expensive. And, you know, can we keep up this kind of appreciation forever? No. Um, you know, so it would be nice if the market maybe settled down a little bit. Um, but it's, it's a lot of this has to do, I don't, you know, they're not really talking about supply and demand and how people mm -hmm. don't want to really sell their properties right so when you're in a supply demand model things are just going to be more valuable and get bid up more so oh a hundred percent i'm just going to actually expand this one really quickly before i drop the screen share but it says surging demand for housing during the pandemic has led the country's insurer to warn of escalating risks and they vowed to take steps to boost affordability yet the central bank's low low rate policies have helped fuel demand i think that's one of the things that i'm seeing right now is really a political run in the media for all things real estate like we were talking about yesterday at the cbc article because it does really create division right and that's the sad thing that i see in the world today is there's so much division yet we're more similar than we are different like you look at me and say well justin's a real estate agent core is an investor i'm like yet yeah, you know sports family maybe fishing maybe you know f1 like there's many different things that we may share as commonalities and we're more similar than we are different so I think it'd be prudent for people to look at the headlines and not, you know, be as concerned about what the media is trying to portray and start getting around people like Corey. Now, what are you seeing in the marketplace from a provincial level? Like I know you're based out of Sarnia, but what markets are you investing in right now? Yeah, so I, I mainly invest in Sarnia and London uh, just because those are markets I've been investing in a long time. I, I know them really well. I've got a lot of great contacts in those markets. Um, but I also, since I, I work with about 60 to 70 real estate students, um, you know, I'm following, following the market all over the province. Right. And I mean, we're seeing prices going up. There's, there's some cities where the market's going up a little bit slower or there's, you know, it's still, um, there's opportunities there, right. Because so many people are, are fishing in different, uh, fishing holes per se. Right. Um, so there's still opportunities out there, but overall, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where you do need to be smart with what you're doing and you know, you got to still take the emotions out of your buying and make sure it's about the numbers. If you're, if you're a buy and hold investor like me. And are you noticing shifts from say primary to secondary and tertiary markets? Like the Sarnia market, I know has had quite a bit of increased attention, right? Do you think that's the GTA effect of London becoming Kitchener and Sarnia becoming London? Like there seems to be a little bit of that dynamic happening. 
Yeah, I think it's from like the migration that happened uh, during, you know, the pandemic here, like people just kind of started spreading out like marbles if they could work virtually. And then if a market's getting, you know, where the numbers don't make sense for them anymore, mm -hmm. they're going to go, okay, well, I'm going to go from London to St. Thomas, or I'm going to go to Elmer or yeah, London to Sarnia, where there's still some other opportunities for them. Um, I still think they're all great markets. And, you know, make sure you're just buying in a, in a good neighborhood where you can still cash flow and hit your numbers. Yeah, real estate is real estate and people are people, right? I, I network a lot with people across Canada and the States. Um, we started a random room on Clubhouse. It was the Canadian Real Estate Network. So every Wednesday, 1130 to 12, super quick. And hey, what are you seeing, right? And we've been watching week after week after week, you know, some weeks where they're like, oh man, sellers are just completely unrealistic. You know, they're they're not getting offers on offer date and then they're raising their price a hundred thousand dollars because they had you know expectations and it, there are these little dips and lulls that are happening in the marketplace. We've noticed that's actually nationwide, like not even just in Ontario, not even just in Canada. I mean, I'm talking to people from Atlanta and they're literally experiencing the same wow. thing at the same time. That's how fascinating it is that we are kind of more similar than we are different. Um, Lindsay, you're super active in the investing space. I know, you know, your boots on the ground. Why don't you give people a little bit of insights as to what you're seeing when you're submitting offers and, you know, just the general climate, because I think that would help people quite a bit. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the market is changing, as we like to say, weekly here. Um, we're in a market where I just looked at the multifamily listings and we, we are under 40 active multifamily listings in Elgin and Middlesex. And in the summer, that number was 75 to 80. So um, not a lot of listings, still very high demand. I find that uh, there is a lot more attention on real estate investing as um, people are kind of realizing that uh, putting your money into a hard asset like real estate, you're just, um, it's a little bit safer than maybe some of the stocks. So I think that <laughs> lots of people are still having that attention on um, real estate investing. And with that, our multifamily listings are down a little bit more. With that being said, we're seeing a bit of a pickup in the last couple of weeks. And um, I know Corey talks a lot about strategy on his um, social media and everything like that. So we're seeing shifts in strategies um, where maybe uh, buy and hold doesn't make sense as much in London. If you're looking strictly for cash flow, maybe um, switching a unit to an Airbnb rental or just thinking of different ways that you can make the numbers work because there's always um, an, a way to make the numbers work in the market. It's it's just depending on the strategy. We got a question actually from our boy, Nathan Smith. Corey, where are you finding your most recent acquisitions? MLS, are you finding a lot of off-market deals still? Hey, great question. Um, you know, the last couple of years, I've been doing more off-market just because I can find um, opportunities and just through networking and, and being visible to people. But, you know, there's still opportunities on MLS. So, um, you know, I'd say it's maybe a little more if it's 50 50 maybe it's slightly slanted towards doing some off-market stuff that's just because of the experience and what i do but you know i still find like a huge amount of value like you know me and justin were texting last night about his, his story and it's you know you got to make sure you link arms with a good realtor or else you're just going to get you know whether you're selling or trying to buy like you're going to get smoked on either end so yeah. making sure you're working with a realtor that has the the formula that they know how to list yourself and uh, your, your property make it pop or you know, um, when you're trying to buy something in this super heated market with lots of competition, who are you going to go into battle with? Do you want to go in with a cap gun or do you want to go in with a bazooka? Oh, man, there was a story I shared yesterday from the broke agent and it was two real estate agents having a conversation. I don't yeah. know if you saw it, but the one That's agent the one. essentially was like, hey, you know, why did you accept that other offer? It was the same price of ours. And the response from the listing agent was like, you were missing a bunch of signatures. It was loaded with conditions. And I gave you a chance to revise and you sent me back a disaster of an offer. The consumers don't see that that kind of stuff happens every day. There was actually a CBC article. I decided I'm going to do a reaction video to it later today and walk through it. And I'm going to do it very fair and balanced, right? Because I don't just sit here saying real estate agents are the greatest things since sliced bread because there's good ones and there's terrible ones. And the same thing with reporters and, and shoe collectors and everything on the planet. I mean, there's good people and then there's wolves that are out there, you know, taking advantage of people. So I think it's very insightful that you shared that, Corey. Um, Lindsay and I just did a transaction where one of our investors found a killer off-market deal. We ended up watching them do the renovation. They did an amazing job with it. Um, we marketed it and then we yielded a record setting price. It was a team effort. It wasn't like, oh, we need that deal because we need to get paid on everything. I think you need to find people that, you know, they don't need you, you don't need them, but you're better together than you are apart. And I think passion is definitely a through line. 
I'm going to share my screen one more time. I'm going to share this screen so you can see the Grand Bend Beach in the background again. And I'm going to share an article. So I actually just saw this came out 12 hours ago. New housing projects are coming to London. So there's an absolute boom, 2,700 new units, cracking the 1 billion mark in terms of new development. Now understand too that you know through our network and people that we know, we also heard that land prices are going up dramatically, like up to eight grand a front foot. So like I said, wow. London is the new Kitchener and builders are, you know, back in the day, they used to be able to trade lots back and forth very, very easily, right? They, they want to build a house, maybe pay a small premium. Now it's just not possible. You either have the land or you don't have the land and you're bidding for the allotments, but that's what's causing everything in Southwestern Ontario to pop people to look at, you know, the, the Grand Bends, the Port Stanleys, the Sarnias, the Chathams. It's been fascinating to see um, Elmer's come up on our radar a bunch of times lately. Another um, article that I saw that I thought was funny goes to our, not funny, but well, goes to our other conversation and infill outbursts, 500 new homes, a lot of unhappy neighbors. I mean, people are screaming about the affordable housing crisis, yet when it's a new development that's near their neighborhood, they don't want it, right? Because of the NIMBYism effect. And I do understand good development and city planning matters, but the largest reason that housing prices are going where they're going is there's just no supply. And unless they start bringing more supply to the market, they're going to keep pumping out these articles and it's going to be what it's going to be. Um, another big one that I don't know if um, you're aware of, Corey, you probably are because you're in the know, was Amazon had bought the old Ford plant in Talbotville. Um, fun fact, the family building it, the guy who runs the construction company is my best friend growing up. We built tree houses oh, together. Wow. His parents are salt of the earth. And it was really cool because I watched that company you know, build themselves from the ground up, like work hard. He used to work job sites, sweeping up nails and did every job in the company to get where they got. And I just got a ton of respect for them. And it's been really cool to drive by that site and see the four floors that have already gone up. And I mean, if that's not telling you what's happening in Southwestern Ontario, I don't really know what is, but Corey, you know, what are your thoughts on those couple items? So the affordable housing and then, you know, the influx of new, say talent to the area sure yeah and it'd be great if the you know the cities and the government would make these things easier you know i know friends of mine that are doing secondary suites in london and just trying to deal with the city on these suites is challenging they're really squishing the size and um you know i did uh you know we're, we're converting a, a church into an apartment building and we tried to go the affordable housing route and we just found challenge after challenge and hoops after hoops so we're like, you know what, we're going to do this traditionally and just build it regular, right? Because we've tried to do the right thing and they either didn't like our proposal or they just make it so difficult that it's like, you know, path of, not that we're looking for the path of least resistance, but at some point you got to stop spending time and just get, get going on something, right? So I know you've mentioned before, it'd be great if there was more technological breakthroughs that could make, you know, construction maybe less expensive and all sorts of different things I've been following, uh, uh, 3d printed um you know cement houses for for years and stuff like that you know it'd be great if we could just get some of this stuff to drip down and actually happen right so we're trying <laughs> um sometimes it's it's like an uphill battle right because not everybody's aligned on it it's it's tough i do think the bloat that we have in the offices make it so difficult like there's a land developer we work with and I mean, he's won, I think, five out of five OMB cases and watches it happen the same way every time where the politicians shoot down a project that fits the official plan to satisfy the voter base because they want the people that live there to vote for them again and shoot down the project they don't want in their backyard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he spends 50 grand to go to OMB and OMB looks and says, yeah, this makes a ton of sense. Yet three years got burned in that process a whole lot of time. And people don't really understand the economics and the frustrations that it takes from an investment and a human capital expense for people to do these things where you will get people that hang up their hammers and then you're going to have more of a housing crisis and we need more innovation. We just need more, more streamlined processes where I submit this application. It doesn't go to this person and then back to this person and then back to me and then back to this person without a decision being made over six months. I think that's the biggest problem that I see oh, for sure. Um, yeah, Lindsay, I'm what sure are your opportunities to streamline city hall processes and, and everything, right? It's just, um, and people are so afraid of what they don't know. So when neighbors don't, they, they're like, I'm afraid of what's going to happen in the neighborhood. Well, at the end of the day, it's probably going to be okay. <laughs> you know, it's going to be some change, some disruption, but you know, nothing in life is going to ever happen without some change. Quite often too, it'll actually increase the value of their investment if done properly. And it's, I get it, right? I totally understand. And it's not like we just want to bulldoze everything and say, let's, let's go there. But look at 
the overall health of a community in a city and does it add or does it detract? And if we can look at it simply that way and say, yes, it actually solves this. And who's the person behind it? What's their track record? What type of work do they do? You know, I know there's some fantastic investors that do great projects and I literally want to be proud of it. And then there's other people that it's scorched earth. And I mean, those are the people we really want to keep out of, you know, building communities because that's what it's all about. Lindsay, your last thoughts before we get into the actual interview about the affordable housing and that whole process of, of how we can innovate our industry. Yeah, as someone who is currently working on a secondary suite conversion in London, I hear you. Um, they're not making it easy. And just the certain rules that they have that, yes, they're allowing this, but in one hand, it, they make it impossible to do it. So um, definitely seeing that boots on the ground and um, actually steering a lot of people towards St. Thomas as they seem to be a lot more um, proactive in working with investors they see the crisis of not enough rental properties. So even in their um, in density, like they allow so much more, they're a lot easier to work with. Um, and then you just don't have the rental licenses, which I mean, everything still has to be to code and all of that. But there's some times where you have a building inspector come out and in London, and it one little thing makes it impossible to get these permits. And like, um, I find it a lot easier in St. Thomas. So yes, we're kind of steering people towards St. Thomas quite often. Um, and again, with the price point too, um, you're getting a lot less expensive. The listing that we had uh, come up just this week is one that in London, it's probably would sell double the price. Your rents are very comparable to London. So um, it just it's making it a lot easier to sell St. Thomas in all of this um, as well. Yeah, I think Lindsay, you touched on a couple key points too. And I mean, if you're in political office or you work for the, you know, permitting department, understand there's good people and bad people in that department too. I mean, Wade Jeffries, I know he's done a lot of work in making it helpful for people to understand what they can appeal, what the appeal process looks like and, you know, not be as scared. But I've also seen other incidences a couple years ago when they started implementing the rental licensing review where they were so overwhelmed. Like they said, we're going to go and inspect every single sale that happens. And they realized they didn't have the manpower. Parking meter enforcement officers were showing up. Like literally one of them told our sellers, yeah, I was doing parking meter enforcement a week ago. They just showed up and they have this checklist oh, wow. and they failed a property on it was a 150 year old property that the stairs were not the exact same size going all the way up. They were very safe and everything else too. But the measurements, I'm like, I don't think you understood how they build houses 150 years ago. And again, I think it, it's a back and forth, right? I love seeing innovation and adaptation. I think London actually has one of the best abilities to be an innovator, right? It's a test market for large corporate cities. It has a very dense, well-connected population. It's got industry, it's got industrial manufacturing, it's got health sciences, like technology, go on and on, infrastructure. So I would love to see more innovation from the, the local people. And I think we can get there. I think we get the right people having the right conversations. It'll be awesome. So Lindsay, I'm gonna kick you off for a couple minutes too. You can go sell something while I'm talking to Corey. Corey, I really wanna dig into first and foremost, how did you actually dip your toe into this water? You know, for people watching, they don't know how to get started in investing. So can you take us back a few years and kind of share that journey? Sure. Um, I was exposed to real estate a little bit when I was young. Like my, uh, I guess on my website there, I've been putting deals together when I was 11. I mean, that's, that's when I had my paper route and you had to actually go knock on doors and, and sell stuff and collect money from people, which I think was, is great. Um, you learned so much more back then. We had to actually run it like a real business, but um, my, one of my best friends, dads was a realtor when I was young. So just getting to see him as an entrepreneur, you know, living that lifestyle. And it's like, you know, my dad was a shift worker. So there was a contrast there for sure. Um, my dad had a rental property here and there. We actually lived, you know, the first house that I remember, like I lived in a duplex. There's a little old lady that lived upstairs. I lived on Murphy road, right across from the Wiltshire subdivision. And, um, so I wasn't, uh, I wasn't a stranger to it. I guess I, I got exposed to it a little bit at a young age, which was helpful. And then um, I wanted to get more into it. I started running a painting franchise when I was in second year college. And my boss at the time, he was house hacking when there wasn't even really a term for it. Mm -hmm. You know, he lived in a duplex. There was four bedrooms upstairs. There was a two bedroom downstairs. So, you know, when I saw how he set that up and how he was making money to live, I was like, wow, if, if Charles can do this, I can do this too. Um, so I, I, I was living in London at the time. I just learned from my current landlord. He had about 20, 20 buildings and, 
know, I picked his brain. I offered free advice. I spent time around him. I took him out for breakfast and stuff like that, just to really learn by osmosis and and kind of like be that unofficial mentee or apprentice, right? So I think it's undervalued that people just want, you know, it's great when they reach out and you know the the world is very easy to reach out to people. Mm -hmm. I just had someone text me yesterday, Corey, can we get a call call tomorrow and talk about real estate investing? And you know, if you could mentor me, I'm like. You know, I'd love to, but I, I typically don't take 24 hour meetings because I do build my schedule out a week or two at a time. So yeah, um, if you're patient, you can wait. You know, that's uh, that's typically what people would need to do in this world. But um, so long story long, you know, I, I learned by uh, being exposed to it at a young age and also kind of apprenticing under somebody who had been doing it for 20 years and um, had a really good, really good success with it. Well, you probably got to that point that a lot of people your your position do where in the beginning you're like anybody and everybody you call me i got you right and then all of a sudden you're getting over inundated and you start realizing you know one 10 minute phone call is turning into a 45 minute phone call while you're trying to accomplish the things that you're trying to accomplish and you know you don't want to turn anybody away i actually I, there's a phenomenal guy david spizak um, he was the guy that they actually based the movie jerry Maguire on so he had like one of the largest sports agencies in the world I spent a lot of time with him on Clubhouse and he told me once, he said, you know, I have a standing rule. I'll give anybody five minutes on the phone, 10 minutes if they come to me, but it's got to be scheduled. And sometimes it's three, four weeks. And he's like, the amount of people that I say that to, he's like, they, they just drop off. He's like, it's such a small percentage of people that will actually take him up on that. Yet he's one of the most connected guys out there. I think that's a great lesson for people that are here, especially if you're new to real estate investing. The call to action I gave you at the beginning of the episode where I'm like, jump into the Facebook group, message Corey on Instagram, jump on, get the StreamYard link, ask a question. That is probably the most powerful thing I've seen in people like yourself, Corey, of just the willingness and the fire to say, I want to change my life. I'm going to get around people that are doing things, you know, more than I got to find an off market deal. So what are the greatest lessons you learned from that mentor? And what were the things you did for him that you think brought him value and made him want to pour into you? Well, I, I tried to help save him time, right? So if he, if he, you know, had a, a project or something that would seem kind of menial, um, but I had the resources or the time to do it, I was okay doing that because then I, you know, I'd be like, Hey, I have no problems doing this. Like, can we spend a little bit of time together? Can he answer some more questions if I have some? And he was always, yes, yes, yes. So, um, so give me an idea of what was menial. Like, was it sweeping a hallway? Like, I want people to, to really hear what these things were. Yeah. So at the time, I was I was uh, the VP of operations for Student Works Painting. So I had a lot of painting contacts. So if he had a unit turning over, um, he, you know, he's like, I'll pay for the paint and, you know, your your guy's time. So I'd do the stuff for no profit. I'd still got to make sure the guys would get paid. But, um, yeah. uh, you know, or just, you know, cleaning things up or, you know, cutting, trimming hedges or whatever it might be, right? Because I was living in one of his units. So I want to make sure it was pride of ownership, letting somebody into a unit if you had a contractor that needed to get in. So kind of like property manager type stuff. Um, so I guess it wasn't super, super menial, but he was out there trying to find the next deal or put together, you know, creative things. So that's super interesting. So you were being reliable. I think that's the absolute key, right? Is just being somebody that you can depend on. Now let's go back like, how 20 years you look like you're about 25 so were you always like that as a kid growing up well, i'm for, 45 now so yeah if you go back 20 years i'd be 25 but um i was actually usually a little bit, little bit more, more mature for my age um i was actually always the youngest kid in the class uh so you get used to growing up quickly and um you know i was just put into leadership opportunities at a young age i was a national level weightlifter and i remember my uh my first coach um sometimes if he couldn't go to you know a um a sporting uh, leadership event, you'd say, Hey, do you want to go to this? I'm like, I'm 14. Like, I'm afraid they might not actually get me to want to go and speak in front of the room or something like that. Right. He's like, you'll be fine. You can do it. Right. So just by, you know, traveling and, um, having these leadership opportunities at a young age, I think a lot of people shy away from them. Yeah. Um, whereas you should actually be running towards them. Like, you know, in university, I, I used to recruit on campuses all the time. You'd see these helicopter parents really trying to shelter their kids from these opportunities. They're like, no, there's one thing right now, focus on school, just school, school, school. And I think, you know, it, it's great to get good grades, but it's also the hands that you shake and the relationships that you make. And um, I used to treat sport uh, school like a sport when I was younger too, as I was trying to get the best marks and that, that sort of thing until I realized that, you know what, really it's, it's the relationships you're going to foster and um, the time that you spend with the other people, you know, how deep you can go with some of those relationships are just as important as the grades. 100%. I was with an Ivy prof actually last week. 
Um, my wife went to Ivy and it's been fascinating to see the connection of people. Right. And it's, you know, not, she would never tell you that. That's the funniest thing about my wife. Like she's the probably most humble woman you'll ever meet. But every so often she'd be like, Oh, Hey, did you hear so-and-so um, open this company? Right. And they're at the other end of the planet and they're innovating. And even the, the Ivy prop said, he's like, it's not necessarily the things that they learn at Ivy is like, it's maybe the ability to learn. He's like hundred percent. It's if you're there and you develop relationships, you truly become a wealthy person. Um, Diane Spremo actually jumped in. Hey, Diane, nice to see you. Um, I want to change my life. I want to surround myself with people who can guide me and give back value as I learn more. And I've seen Diana so many times and you know she's got such a grace about her. What would you give her as advice to surrounding herself with people who can guide her? Well, make sure that it's somebody that lines up with your values, right? So uh, you got to be mindful of who you surround yourself with because now you're going to be not really judge, but other people are going to kind of see you through the same lens. Um, you know, and I think just the vibration that we put out there's, I, you know, there's, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm grateful that we're on this uh, screen talking together here, Justin. And I think it was just a matter of time before we did anyway, because, because we have so many common, uh, you know, friends and interests and, um, you know, traits and values. So when you, when you make decisions based on values, whether it's who you decide to hang out with or who you decide to become a life partner with or do business with, yeah, it's, it definitely gives you a much stronger foundation. You know, it's, it's more difficult to go wrong when you guys have so many different reference points and values that you, you have common ground on. So, um, you know, make sure that you know what your values are, like, what are your top 10 values that you stand for and make sure that someone that you want to mentor under, or, you know, spend more time with, uh, has, you know, a lot of those values as well. Yeah. And actually Lindsay had a question as well. I know Lindsay's one of those people that I've watched over the years, really gravitate and find amazing people around her. And Lindsay, what was your question for Corey? Yeah, definitely. I couldn't agree more with you on surrounding yourself with the right people. Um, that's definitely been a game changer in everything that um, I've done. And um, I'm curious because I know that you um, have a lot of people around you that are like top performers, they're action takers. How do you find these people? How, like, how do you attract these people, your tribe to you? Great question. Well, maybe they see what I'm doing and they're like, you know, I, I don't want to even reach out unless I'm a person of action. Um, and again, we've never really advertised what we do. So ever since I retired from corporate, so I know I mentioned I was a VP of operations for a, a student based uh, painting company, even though they're students, they're actually one of the largest painting companies in Canada. I was just talking to the owner a couple of weeks ago and you know, they did like $23 million worth of painting and, and half the country. So probably 40 or 50 million when you look at the whole country. So not bad for a bunch of university uh, students um, running around with paintbrushes and window cleaning equipment, but um, yeah, so it's it's important to um, you know have that presence yourself so that you can attract that back in the mirror. And um, you know, sometimes I do have like a little bit of a like, hey, you know, if you're this kind of person, stay in touch, sort of thing. But you know, for the most part, we don't advertise what we do. When I retired from corporate, I just had a lot of people reaching out saying, "Hey, Corey, you know, how did you retire from <laughs> from corporate? You know, I want to have an escape plan too, or you know, just have more hard assets in my portfolio." Um, so we put together something that can help other people and we've always wanted to keep it that way. I don't pay for Facebook ads or anything like that. Um, it's, it's almost like if you've ever read the book, uh, blue fishing, um, I almost want it to be like a kind of like an inner circle where if you find out about it and you know, some common people and it's something that you can actually, you know, you have the work ethic to do, then great. We can, uh, we can see if it makes sense. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that when you're really clear on who you are and who, um, whatever you're putting out there, it's exactly who you're attracting. I've definitely noticed that in the past little bit that I have more so been attracting my ideal client. And it's definitely because I'm clear on who I want them to be and um, just in return attracting them. But I would love to get your advice too. So someone's starting real estate investing. Um, maybe they're a little bit nervous by all that negative news. Uh, they are in their nine to five. They want, they see people that are succeeding in real estate investing. What advice would you give to these people that are wanting to get into real estate investing, but maybe are a little nervous? I think they just have to listen to watch some of your reels there, Lindsay, and they'll see, you know, the one about the market crashing and you laughing and stuff. Um, obviously everybody needs confidence, right? And what's going to help them have that confidence to get through the other side. Cause these are big purchases, right? These are probably going to be the biggest purchases of their life. However, it's such a, it can be such a stable asset class too on the other side. So making sure that they, you know, whatever type of learner they are, maybe they need to see more numbers or maybe they, they're a little more kinesthetic. So they need to actually get out there and see more properties or spend some time with a renovator to understand it's 
everything is solvable. Everything can be fixed. Um, you know, so you can't, you can't go wrong with just exposing yourself. But on the other hand, so many people just get analysis paralysis and they figure that they got to learn everything about something before they, they jump in. Um, again, I, I think we were kind of talking about mentorship and apprenticing and just trying to find a way to get around someone. Um, and you guys have been fantastic here. You have this one to many platform, you know, and that's, that's our, the best way that we can impact people, right. By being one to many. So, you know, make sure you spend enough time around the people that you resonate with. And there's uh, I just shot an Instagram video yesterday. that's going to be coming out. There's really only like five things you need to know. You got to learn a little bit about what you're trying to do. Um, you only need about 60 or 70% of the knowledge to actually jump in and take some action, make a plan. The plan doesn't have to be super intricate. The plan could actually just be linking arms with someone like, like you two, some great realtors, and then take a bunch of action with your plan, review how it's going, improve it, and just keep doing that, right? That's what, that's what successful people do. At the end of the day, it's not rocket science. Um, there's going to be obviously pieces of property or certain kinds of multifamily buildings that you might not want to buy right now. Um, but you know, make sure that you know what you want. You're really clear. Cause if you're not clear, then, you know, you'll end up anywhere. It's just like, if you don't have a plan <laughs> anywhere will do. Right. Yeah. I think it's interesting. You mentioned earlier too, about your core values. I wanted to go back to that for a second too, because quite often people that accomplish things they are, they fall forward into it and they kind of just haphazardly start doing one thing, then another, then they realize they're doing everything at the same time. Did you establish your core values before, or what does that self work look like to guide somebody to establish what their core values may be? Yeah, it's, it's not super complicated. I mean, you can go on the internet and just Google like a list of 50 core values. And then what I recommend people do is boil it down to their top 20 and then their top 10. Because mm -hmm. a lot of them might resonate with you, but if you literally had to go and be in front of your maker and, um, you know, just like he's like, what are your top 10 values, right? You got to boil it down to that. It's uh, it's so important. You should be able to rattle those off. I mean, when I talk to any experts, you know, it doesn't matter what industry, the ones that I truly know can talk the talk are the ones that have the experience, right? Sometimes you'll hear people over explaining things in an industry because they want to sound like they know what they're talking about, but there's a very big difference between those two. So on the real estate education piece, what are your top resources for investors in terms of consuming information or, or where do you go to get your news and, and whatnot, podcasts, whatever. I just think it'd be super helpful to the audience. Well, there, there's tons of great resources out there. We, we like to make them, most of my students are Canadian based. So we make sure that they're getting, you know, their, their content Canadian because there's big differences between our company uh, countries. There's similarities and, you know, in overall themes and like just human psychology and stuff like that, but it's, we're in a totally different market up here. Yeah. Um, and I, I just like to keep it simple, you know, in the beginning. And that's actually why I spent so much time and so much money to be around Tony Robbins. I got to spend 800 hours with him one year and he takes really complicated subjects and topics. And like most of my notes were one liners. Like I filled mm. up like four books and it's like all one liners, one paragraphers, because that's really the definition of true wisdom, right? When you can take something complicated and turn it into something simple, that's, that's pure brilliance. Fascinating. So why real estate investing? I think it's a key question because there's so many different investment vehicles out there. Why do you think real estate is one that you enjoy so much? You know, I like it because you can actually influence it a lot more than other things. You know, when you actually, and there's nothing wrong with, Hey, cryptocurrency or the stock market, they're all great. If you know how to do it, and I know a little bit about them and I've dabbled in them and, and that sort of thing. I do believe in diversification that you shouldn't be all in on one asset class. Um, but for me, when I, when I just saw like how the, the stock market was really influenced by the big players and I'm like, I'm not a big player, I'm a, I'm a smaller guy mm -hmm. and I want to be able to take something and I can force the appreciation up on it. Right. So you're going to get natural appreciation. You can also have forced appreciation. You're going to have your mortgage pay down all these other things. So it's just, you know, for me, there's, there's so many ways to make money in real estate, which is a double edged sword as well. Um, what are you going to actually do to specialize? I'm a big believer of do, do something like be known for something and do it really, really well before you start adding all kinds of other different streams of income. I've got, you know, four or five different streams of income, but that took like 15 years to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And people see people like Justin or Gary V or whatever. And they're like, well, why can't I just go do what all these other big people are doing? And it's like, do you realize they have a huge team behind them? So, you know, if they want something done, they just send off an email and say, you know, start working on it. We have a skunk works division and they, they have the time and that's what they're here for is to take on new opportunities. Right. So 
Um, I just like it because it's you can really impact it a lot more and the, all the different uh, avenues to make profit in it. And I think also like people don't see all the steps that took someone to get there. They just see that success and they see all that they're doing right now. And they're like, well, why can't I get there overnight? But they don't see all of those years that someone has put into all of those steps to build this company and all of that. So I think that that's also very important too. We've talked about advice that you would give to someone starting their journey, but I know you talk a lot about scaling and like being an expert in something. What advice would you give to someone that is maybe has a few rental properties and they're looking to really go bigger and to scale? Yeah, people want to go bigger and scale. That's when I find that you, you just can't build a business on a broken foundation. So you got to make sure that the foundation is strong. And, you know, whether that means your power team, making sure that everybody that's on your team has been well vetted. They're an A player. Um, there's really no time, um, you know, people think they have all the time in the world, especially when you're younger. I remember being in my teens and early twenties, it's like, oh, I got lots of time. But now when you're in your thirties, thirties, forties, fifties beyond, you're like, there isn't time. Like we got to compress time and try to see how we can accelerate things more. So start off with your power team, make sure that you've vetted them well. And again, that you guys, you know, there's good communication that you have common goals and you want to help each other. And you're, you're going to refer your power team members and stuff as well. Super important. Um, even something just as simple as making sure you're not doing your own books, like hire a good uh, bookkeeper, a good accounting firm that vibrate with you, you know, your legal team, your real real estate team, um, your inspection team, your contractors, and realize that some of these people might turn over people, people retire, you know, mm -hmm. contractors lose their way. So it's not going to just be a once and done. Right. Um, so it's, you can focus on the power team and also the mindset, right? So it's, it's kind of overspoken like people are like oh yeah mindset yeah i got a good mindset and all that sort of stuff but it's like have you ever actually done hard things you know like you mentioned like people uh they, they only see the a roll type things right mm -hmm. I, I didn't make a story as i stayed up to 1 30 last night getting paperwork done to be able to really check the week off and make sure that anything i said i was going to do i got done right and i'm okay with that and i don't need a ton of sleep to be able to get up and be excited and passionate about what i do so um it's not just about the a roll um, but it's, it's that man mindset, right? We got to have the right mindset and, you know, making sure that you're listening to great podcasts and people that will inspire you and lift you up. Like as a group, um, I don't know if I have the book handy here. So with our, with our real estate students, I used to give them a list of a hundred books that might impact their life. Right. And then they, mm -hmm. they kind of go buy the books that they liked or the authors that they liked. I'm like, no, that's really not how I wanted to prescribe things. So now we, we have a monthly book club and the book that we just read was Can't Hurt Me. Yes, yeah, David fun. Goggins. David Goggins for years. He's the audio book is so cool too because there's some bonus stuff in there. I don't know if you've listened to it, but. I did, yes. I usually don't do audio books, but after I heard like there's extra content on there, I'm like, I'm going to do the audio book on this one. But, um, you know, you really got to, you know, our brain is, um, it's more plastic than we believe or that other people have told us that it can be even at a, an older age. So um, it may not be as natural sponge like my kids right now they, they're picking up everything and i see my two-year-old and how she's learning and growing and developing it's just so amazing but um we can still have a huge amount of impact on our on our brains and you know our brain controls the body right so we got to make sure that we treat this thing we train it like a dog you know you will get to go and have your snack or your treat or whatever once you do the hard thing so go do the hard thing so many people are afraid of you know uh, being uncomfortable you know mm -hmm. i think maybe just being an athlete right like that was like what we did. Like you're not going to get stronger or faster or improve if you don't actually like push yourself to the limit and really understand what intensity is. And uh, as we get older, the only way we can improve is by higher quality reps of what we're doing. That might be phone calls. That might be lifting weights or whatever it is. And the intensity. So many people just bring so much low energy and, you know, low energy leads to low effort, you know, and then they wonder why they don't have the results, right? So... Well, there's a quote out there that, you know, men live lives of quiet desperation. I think the desperation comes from seeking comfort. You know, never ever in the history of life has somebody remembered a 30 second roller coaster ride versus a three day, you know, rainy camping trip because the camping trip was uncomfortable, but you went through something together. There's so many through lines in this conversation. Like you spoke earlier on and Lindsay mentioned it about nobody sees what's behind the scenes, right? They don't see, you know, for over a decade, somebody being every aspect of the company. Like I remember when I started, I mean, I spoke as if I was a much larger corporation that I was, I was the marketing department. I was the accounting department. I was the media company. I was the investment division. And then as you expand and you get around people that 
are showing you that no, no, like this person did it, you can do it too. I think if you can formulate a plan and absorb information, what you said is so key, right? Making sure you're ingesting the proper information and getting around people that are showing you different ways of doing things and then having some type of routine because I do believe that having some type of routine will trigger that innate challenge that, you know, today I didn't necessarily want to get up at the time I got up at, but every single Saturday I do a Saturday morning sales call. And one of the guys that speaks on it is Brian Benstock and he owns Paragon Honda, the number one Honda wow. dealer in the entire planet in New York. Right. So the fact that I'm like, man, I get to be in proximity to this guy and, you know, hear him talk about how he'll come in and his team, the guys like I did 30 deals last month. And he's like, congratulations like that's great maybe for you right now but how does that look if you compare yourself against amazon right and i mean it just what do you mean compare yourself against amazon and he gave me that mindset shift that i'm like yeah i can take on amazon right as crazy as that is to think to the layman out there i think that's the big difference between somebody like yourself Corey, is how you think of things are there any habits or routines that you have in your life that you think are helpful with maintaining that energy or, or things that help protect that growth Great question. Um, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, they want to live their life in balance and it kind of goes back to the whole comfort thing. And I believe in going back to balance. We should go back to balance. We should, you know, find time to sharpen the saw. Um, you know, for me, I can't take tons and tons of days off. You know, even if I go on a seven day vacation with the family, it's like, I'll take a couple half days here and there, but it's just my mission and my purpose in life is very clear and it's very bright. So I want to make sure that you know, we, we, nobody knows how much time we have on the earth. And I just want to make sure I can make as much impact and legacy as I can while I'm here. So, you know, some of the habits and things that people can, can do is just make sure you're a student of the game. Like you, you mentioned your wife went to Ivy, right? So mm -hmm. they have high level networking events in Ivy. They definitely have group work in Ivy. They definitely have, you know, getting yourself into smaller rooms, just like you were talking. So, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's not always rocket science, right? Go and look at what other successful people are doing and and try to see what what they do. I'm big for big on variety. So I'm not like one of these person where I wake up and I have the, like, the same morning routine every single day. Every single one of my days is different. But I want to make sure that I spend time on myself on, you know, looking at my goals and my, my plan for the day. Uh, making sure that I also incorporate movement into my day too. So I might not go and hit the weights every single day. But I, I'm definitely making sure that I'm getting my steps in to make sure that you know, I'm actually standing right now during this podcast because awesome. you know sitting is the new the new smoking. So we got to do these little hacks just to make sure that we can you know it's not like 50 or 100 years ago when there was a lot more factory work and everybody just had these bronze bodies because they were they were so labor intensive, right? We got to yeah. make sure that we can still incorporate some of those things into our our daily uh, routines. But um, you know, make sure that what you do works for you and that you're not afraid to go and question it and say, hey, do I have another level? Is there something else I could be doing? Um, am I getting too comfortable? Um, I have a term that, that I did a, a blog about and it's like, you know, make sure you're not stuck on the uh, intermediate hill indefinitely. Mm -hmm. um, you can go take that ski lift up to the black diamonds once in a while and just see what other people are doing. Right. I think when you're in a, when you're around top performers, you'll just start to expand your mind of what is possible, do bigger it, deals and be more comfortable with different things. It's so funny you say that, right? Because I do think you know, even if you're falling down the black diamond hill, Hey, you got down it, you're going to be okay. Right. You can go down it on your butt if you have to, but just seeing the other people and what they're doing, people, you do pick things up by watching others and how they do things. And I love the comparison, right? Because Corey, I need the structure. I need the repetition because I can be, I have a very addictive personality and bright, shiny object. So the structure enables me to just maintain my focus, but that's what this world is. It's a dichotomy of different personalities and what works for you and works for me and then how we can collaborate. Um, I'm sitting down now because I did a workout this morning. I'm going to send you a really cool YouTube channel. I, I found it's a local gym actually in London called Movement. Um, Luke cool. and Will and uh, Isaac run it. And they actually, I watched their TikTok and they were talking about, you know, maintaining mobility and fluidity. And they said, yeah, you can do 15 minutes a day. But truthfully, if you do it four times a day, so take four 15 minute breaks throughout your day, watch what happens. I've been doing it for a week. And I can tell you like my hip issues, my back issues, like a lot of these little things that happen over time are becoming looser. I think the same principles apply in real estate investing and building a business. I know Lindsay is going to pipe back in and as well. Lindsay, what are your thoughts? 
Yeah, definitely. And I think what's really important to touch on here is Corey is obviously in a place where he could just kind of um, take a month off, take a year off, like, and be okay. But there's, I love that there's still that desire to want more and like a bigger mission and purpose. Um, I'd love for you to really touch on what living life on your own terms means to you. Cause I know you say it a lot. I know it's the title of this um, live stream right now. Uh, so if you could touch on that, that would be amazing. Amazing. Totally. And it's, it's kind of cool. Like uh, I was just talking with a friend of mine. Uh, I'll just go back to something that Justin mentioned there. I know, I actually know the guys. I know Will and I know Isaac. I actually took Isaac to nationals for uh, Olympic weightlifting. So um, kind yeah, of small that's world. awesome. He used to be six degrees of separation, but so often now we're like one degree of separation. Like it's, you know, six degrees of separation, Kevin Bacon. That was before the internet was big or social media, right? So now we're just so connected. Nationals um, for, you mentioned athletics before. What were you doing? Yeah, weightlifting. So I used to be wow. on the national weightlifting team when I was younger. And, um, you know, I never made a big team, but I was top three in Canada. So, um, you know, Dave Earl as well. And I'm sure a whole bunch of wow. I, I mean, again, proximity. Yeah. Well, how cool is life? I'm going to bounce back out, but I just had to pop back on for that. No worries. So can you repeat your question again there, Lindsay? Yes. Uh, so I just kind of go through um, what living life on your own terms means to you, because I know that you're in a point where you could just kind of take the whole year off. Um, but there's obviously something within you that drives you to do more. And how do you define that for yourself? And then how do you help others define it for them? Totally. I think, you know, I think for people, they, um, for me, uh, having choice is so important especially even more now and now with, with what's going on in our, in our whole landscape. But, you know, when you actually can make the choices that you want to make throughout a day and especially with the time, like how you're going to spend your time. Um, I'm blessed to have been an entrepreneur since I was, you know, like 19 years old and um, you know, I'm unemployable. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I like that I can go make my own paycheck and just, you know, what you put in is what you get out and life on people's terms is going to mean something different for them. Right. So for me, I'm going to be probably doing deals and looking at real estate until I'm well into my 70s and 80s or beyond if they find a way to keep us you know, live into our hundreds or something like that. But I'm always going to be finding ways to just, you know, make the money, make more money while we sleep and that sort of thing, because that's just something I'm really passionate about. You know, I don't look at it as work. I mean, to me, this is fun. It's, it's like a game or a sport. And as long as you're making progress, you're winning. Um, so. Again, it comes back to, you know, do, does somebody actually have a mission statement? So my mission statement is to be a, a financial leader to others and to love and support, encourage them to step up and do the same, like take some action and go make some positive change in your life. And, you know, um, it's it's one of those things I highly recommend, even if you got to, you know, lock yourself in an Airbnb and just really think about like, what is, what am I on this earth for? Like what, if I were to have a one sentence or a, a one breath mission statement, what, what would it be here for, right? So there's different things that I have our students do, whether it's a seven levels uh, wide deep exercise or coming up with a mission statement for their life. You know, what is your purpose here? And I, I believe we all get called to be a leader. It's just not a lot of people actually answer that call to be the leader. And, you know, we can always change our decision. We can always make a better choice. So, you know, life on your terms is going to mean something different to everybody. But for me, it's, it's freedom of choice. So I can actually decide what to do with my time because time is, one of those resources that you're not going to get back. We don't know how much we have. And I think we can all say that we've had examples of, you know, lives that have been cut too short. So, so. Yeah. I, I love the urgency. Um, what are your top investing strategies right now? And then we'll get into some final wrap up questions for you. Cause I want to be respectful of your time on Saturday. No worries, man. So I'm, uh, I'm doing a few different things right now. Like I'm doing some development. I'm doing still buy and hold my multifamilies, especially if there's, you know, a little bit of a, a, a bit of a sharp price on the buy. Um, I like furnished rentals. So, mm -hmm. you know, I don't do Airbnb necessarily. I do medium term rentals, I guess people would call it. Um, or what furnished rentals used to be before Airbnb, which is like one month or longer. Mm -hmm. We've got 14 of those. And I just like it because, you know, you're typically, especially the way that we market ours, um, we're dealing with professionals that have either had like an insurance claim or their house has taken too long to build or their house sold too fast. I'm sure you've yeah. seen that before. Oh, tons that right now. It's crazy. Time. Um, so they just need a place to stay for two, three, four months. Or even what we're seeing now is if people can't travel, if they used to be a snowbird, but now they can't get over the border, they just want to actually stay and get a nice furnished, you know, a unit that's close to their grandkids. So it, it checks a lot of boxes and typically our rents are like 40, 50, 60% higher, which is kind of cool. 
Um, I'm actively looking right now for a cottage type of rental so we can kind of have our cake and eat it too. You know, <laughs> we can get that those strong weekly rentals in the summer and then also get some place where I don't have to go and, you know, wait for six months to go get a booking on Airbnb because it's so hot. Um, you know, what else are we doing here? Uh, I've done some rent to owns before. I think that's a very noble strategy if you link up with a reputable company, um, even doing some money lending too. So, you know, if I've got money in the bank, it's like, you know, you look at what inflation is doing now, mm -hmm. your, your money is actually losing money every single month if you don't have it put to work for you. So, but again, this has been, you know, 15 or 20 years to get to this point. In the beginning, it might just be somebody needs to go all in on finding that duplex or that house hack for them, that mortgage helper. Like that's how I started. Uh, my first building was a sixplex and uh, it was just a bigger house hack because I was living in the biggest unit right on the corner of Oxford and Thornton Street yeah. um, before they built the student uh, duplex right beside me. You know, we live in, I was living in this big old uh, yellow brick duplex. You can look it up, uh, 420 Oxford Street East. So kind of a cool property, lots of history there. Yeah. Super, super interesting. Yeah. And I, I love the the pathway and what's possible. I think that's what this is all about too. So a couple of rapid fire questions, and then we'll get you out of here. So how has failure shaped your life? Oh man, I, like failure is so important. And I've got a saying in my life, you know, fail fast and fail often. And if you had a choice, try to fail when the stakes are a little bit lower, right? Don't, don't fail when it's like epic failure. <laughs> um, those are harder to recover from, but that's really how, you know, I, I watch my kids and that's how they learn how to walk. You know what? You don't just tell your kids like, hey, sorry, you fell down. I guess you're just not going to be a walker. Like, you know, no, like that's how, like how do airplanes fly? How do spaceships fly? Like they're off course all the time. Yeah. So, you know, don't be afraid of failure. I think when people say that they're afraid of failing, it's it's more than just that, right? They're, they're afraid of looking silly. They're afraid of what other people are going to think. You know, don't, don't actually be afraid of like not getting the result that you want because you didn't actually have it. You know, like people say, oh, I didn't get the sale. It's like, well, you never had it anyway. So nothing really changed. Like lots of times they're just they're just looking at it in the wrong lens. Um, but failing, failing is so important. You know, don't be afraid to fail. Yeah, I heard a recent term I didn't even know existed called agile project management. And it was coming from somebody that works on like institutional level project management, where back in the day they would create a prototype and they would implement it. Right. And then, you know, that, that's the job. But agile, I guess now is they create a quicker, faster prototype, implement, and then ideate. So they just revise new prototype, revise new prototype. And it's all about speed. I think yeah. speed kills um, in today's ages. And that said, you know, you've got 100% capacity in Corey's brain. What are you learning right now? I guess the what is the bulk of your learning focused on? So is it your core competencies and what you're, you're currently focused on? And what is that 20% that's kind of like, throw away stuff but could be huge one day like nfts blockchain whatever that looks like i don't know like what's that 20 percent that you're chewing on yeah you know for me it actually is uh some blockchain you know i uh, i ordered some books about you know earlier this week because you know i just i want to start investing in the space i do believe in the technology um you know some people think that us real estate investors you know hate on cryptocurrency and all that sort of stuff um, it, it just wasn't really proven enough for me to go and start investing a lot in it. And frankly, doing really well in real estate investing. So mm -hmm. why would I start to do my efforts and, and spend too much time in another space? But when you see how fast it's growing, it's actually growing faster than the, the internet in the 90s. So um, I believe in the technology. I believe it's a strong technology. We just aren't super clear on who are going to be the long-term winners in that you know cryptocurrency race. Um, so that's where I'm spending some of my time right now. Um, where else, you know, I'd, I'd like to get more into uh, trading options, but again, it's, you know, too often we, we can dilute our efforts and, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I've done everything over time, right? I had a, I had like a candy route, you know, back when I was in my twenties and I, I sold the route, like I broke even on it. It was great, you know, collecting a bunch of quarters and loonies, um, paid off the route really fast, but it just came back to like, what is, what am I really good at? Right? Like, I'm just yeah. going to keep spending time at what I'm really good at. So if it's real estate, and coaching and mentoring and impacting other people because I've got 25 years of experience in that space. I'm going to keep doing that, right? So, but I think it's also important to go, hey, don't just have the blinders on. And, you know, we want to make sure that we're exposing ourselves to some other markets. Um, uh, maybe it's also just investing out of province, you know, like on, there's a lot of, as a landlord, there's, you know, it's not the most friendly province for, for landlordism. So, uh, you know, looking a little bit into the East Coast, looking a little bit into Alberta as well. Alberta, I think, is a place to watch right now too. Um, East Co and East Coast, New Brunswick, and Alberta, both of those markets, you know, they they took a bit of a beating over the last couple of years. But typically, those are the ones where the first movers are going to look at the economics of it. Actually, Sasha Chuchu's Graybrook talked about this on the podcast. They bought the largest office building 
vacant in Calgary. And these are the same guys yeah. that started Liberty Village in Toronto. And if, you know, back in the day, everybody thought that was crazy. Well, when you hear they're doing something that sounds crazy, probably a good idea. Um, I was going to also ask you, what are you doing that excites you? Like, it can be completely outside of real estate, but is there anything that's exciting, Corey, these days? Um, for me, exciting, I guess, would be, you know, just always seeing what's possible with, with uh, you know, as you get older with your physical body. Um, I made a comeback to weightlifting. I took like literally tw 12 years off and it was um, somebody that worked out under David Earl. And he was yeah. like, hey, there's only one coach here. It's David Earl and he, he's great, but there's a whole bunch of us here. Like, would you mind coming out? And, you know, you used to do a lot of this stuff, right? And it's, um, you know, so I dusted off the lifting shoes and went back out there. And, you know, now that you're older, like your personal bests are different every year because they're actually maybe declining a little bit. Um, and for me, like, like lifting heavy is just, it's too much wear and tear on the body. So for me, I, you know, I'm more challenged by like cycling and running. That was kind of what I picked up when I left the sport of weightlifting. So, um, you know, biking is a lot easier on the body. That's for sure. We just bought a Peloton. I'm probably going to buy a, a kicker core um, later today just so we have some variety at home. But, you know, that's just seeing what I'm still capable of and, and sure. still pushing the limit. Um, obviously, being safe with it. I actually tore my uh, meniscus in my knee, just trying to be too aggressive and, and left how I used to lift when I was young. There are, uh, you know, back when we're in our 20s, we're invincible. But as we get older, we have to be a little bit mindful of that. Hey, you know, it's more about longevity and and being able to be in this, you know, physical body for um, another 40, 50 years. Yeah, you talk about mindset can be hurtful sometimes. You think you, we can do what we used to do. And I'm in the same place as you. I'm going through rehab on my left hip. Um, and I dial back strength and conditioning because as much as I want to push and, and be good at strong things and being conditioned right now, it's a lot of soft tissue work and mobility. And that's OK. I think everybody needs to understand that dichotomy between what we're talking about in the real estate space and even the health spaces is, is the exact same thing. Right. You're looking at that that growth of what you want to accomplish and then actually doing the things to accomplish them. So the most important question, the very last question, you know, we want to honor you and give you our platform because you made time to be here. So what can we do for you? Is there anywhere we can go to connect with you? Is there a project you're working on or a book that we can buy? Just anything that you want to mention. Hey, you know, I, I, I usually don't like to ask too much and I don't really have a whole lot of asks, you know, if people want to follow and, and, you know, if they liked what we talk about today, I'm pretty easy to find, you know, people can go find me on Facebook or Instagram. I'm probably the most active on Instagram. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking to do more, more things like this here, Justin as well. Sure. So if people want to have me on their platform, that's all cool too. And, uh, maybe even just a personal request, maybe I can come into your studios and see how you guys do certain things. Cause you know, I'm, I'm going to be starting up a, a podcast. I was just talking to my social media guy. You know, like we, we want to get this going here in the next month or two. So um, I'm probably overthinking it for sure. Yeah, but, um, it's as fancy day, as it but... looks. So I can definitely say you pop into the office sometime. We'll show you the three or four different ways. And again, we're we're trying to get better and better and better, right? We found ways of doing things and, you know, the, the preparation work that we do and the back end, I'll show you all that. Something I am going to do for you is I'll bring you into the breakfast with champions rooms in the morning because I think you're cut from the same cloth as a lot of those people um, I'll try and get you featured on there as well. We're ending the room November 5th and it's turning into something else. But I think, again, it's it's fascinating to have people like you that are trying to do big things and do hard things. And hopefully this inspired people. I know Diana said that. Thank you, Corey, for sharing your wisdom and experience. Thank you, Justin and Lindsay, for bringing us value. You guys always rock. Yeah, thank you for Diana. No I mean, these this is the reason that we do it. So appreciate it. Lindsay, any parting words? No, I would definitely go and check Justin out, go to the studio. He kind of threw me off a cliff and said I had to do a podcast as well. So he's he's definitely the one to, uh, he'll give you some good value on that. And um, Corey, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate having you here. And I know at the beginning we kind of talked about um, there's a lot of different people like realtors that give other realtors a bad name. I know there's a lot of coaches out there that give coaches a bad name too, but it's so great to really hear where you come from and you're definitely one of the real ones. So thank you so much for coming on and really appreciate your time. No, I appreciate you guys having me. And again, this is, this has been a fun chat and, uh, looking forward to, to many more and thanks guys for your, for your questions and, uh, yeah, looking forward to staying in touch. Awesome. Another announcement I forgot to even make at the beginning because I was too excited to talk real estate with Corey in the private Facebook group. So the Prime Real Estate Mastermind, I decided every month we're going to draw randomly from all the members and we're going to double up on the members that are active in the group. So the ones that are commenting, and I'm just going to buy you a book. 
It's going to be focused around real estate investing, or I'm going to make a super connection for you. So I'm going to use my network and actually bring you into conversations and people that you want proximity with. And I, I just think it's so cool to watch people doing what they're doing and growing. So Corey, I am excited for the future and let me know when you want to come to see our studios. We'll do. Awesome. Everybody enjoy your day. Go have fun and find something hard to do. Take care.